Boy, what a true statement, amen? After millions and millions and millions of years, if we were to time in eternity, we still wouldn't be able to thank him enough. And uh, I feel so inadequate when I try to go and praise the Lord in my prayer, my personal devotion time, uh, to be able to be there uh, in God's presence and try to thank him. It just feels so hollow and so inadequate, uh, and I just, I thank the the Lord for all that he's done, but it, it, you just couldn't never do it enough. And what a tremendous truth that we heard in that psalm. In our Sunday morning uh, series, That I May Know Him, uh, we have a little bit of a parenthesis, a sermon preached by the Lord. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, so we have uh, taken our that, that I May Know Him series, uh, trying to get to know the Lord Jesus Christ better. And we've reduced it down now to a very specific series about the Sermon on the Mount. And we just had our first message on it last week, last Sunday. And last week, if you'll go to Matthew chapter 5, we'll remind you of what we looked at last week. Matthew chapter 5. And in Matthew chapter 5, we, we noticed that the Lord had went out into the wilderness and he had prayed all night. And then he had called his apostles and named them apostles. And he had uh, begun to uh, really develop and and to train them and to spend time with them. And then a multitude on that same mountain gathered around Jesus, and he's going to begin to teach and preach what we call now the Sermon on the Mount and give us nine Beatitudes, we call them. Uh, It's all about your inner attitude. It's all about your inner heart. This sermon is all completely developed and designed to get to the heart of the matter, your heart. And it's not about outward things. It's not about whether you come to church. It's not about whether you dress right. It's not about whether you talk right. It's not about those things. This sermon is about your heart. It's about your attitude. It's about what motivates you. It's about what's going on in that brain of yours and things that people on the outside can't see. But God doesn't look on the outside of man. He looks on the heart. And so this whole entire sermon is for Jesus not only to give us some idea and reflection about our heart, but also to prove to us that we cannot keep the idea and the thought of the law. You can't do it. He's going to make it very abundantly clear that you cannot live up to this. This is kingdom life. He's going to talk about the kingdom of heaven a lot in this uh, sermon, and he's referencing this because One of these days, we're going to get out of this old sinful body, we're going to put on a glorified body, and we're going to be able to live forever and reign with the Lord uh, in his millennial kingdom and then afterwards in eternity. And that is the way that the eternity, uh, kingdom living people that have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, that's the way they live. That's what he's going to show us in this sermon. And you can't do it right now on your own. You cannot perform and do and abide by the things he's going to teach us in this sermon on your own. It's just absolutely impossible. And we're going to help you to realize that as we begin in the third beatitude. Now, the first beatitude that we looked at last week is verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And what we talked about is the fact that being poor in spirit has nothing to do with your financial ability. It has to do with the fact that you realize that you are just a terrible, awful sinner. You need to realize that you have sinned. You've disobeyed God, and we do it on a daily basis. And therefore, there is nothing that you can do to get yourself into the kingdom of heaven or to get yourself into eternity with eternal life. You can't forgive your sins. You can't work your way there because we're just terrible people. And we talked about that last Sunday. It was uncomfortable, but we look at, took a look at ourselves and realized how awful that we are. And so in order to get into the kingdom of heaven, you have to be poor in spirit. Those that don't realize how sinful they are will never repent of their sins, and they'll never come to Jesus as their Savior because they don't see the need. And so that's what we talked about last week. And then the second beatitude in verse 4 is just like a... a, a Basically, a couple, it's, it's, it's a partner to the first beatitude. It goes right along with it, hand in hand. Verse 4 says, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. 
Now, if you take this out of the physical, which obviously we know that if you're in the Lord Jesus Christ and you've been saved and you're a child of God, if you mourn the loss of a loved one or the loss of this or that or the other, whatever you're mourning over, God's Holy Spirit will come and comfort you. But that is kind of the sideline idea of this verse. This beatitude is not really talking about the physical. It's not really talking about actual what we call mourning over the death of someone. This is talking about the secondary part of the first beatitude. You see, intellectually, in your mind, you've got to understand that you're a sinner and be poor in spirit in order to be saved. Emotionally, you have to mourn and repent over your sins. If you do not emotionally realize and are sorry and repent for your sins, you can't be saved. And so this is kind of a companion beatitude, if you will, to the first one. And so I want to go on and move to verse 5 and see the third beatitude today. The Bible says in verse 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now don't forget, now the word blessed doesn't just mean happy. That's a lot of the definition you'll get out of books and commentaries and things. They say it means happy. Well, it does mean happy, but it means it on a whole different level than just, ha ha, I got to eat an ice cream sundae and I'm really happy. Okay? Brother Robert gets real happy about ice cream sundaes, apparently. It's a lot more than that. Okay? What this is, is this is that I am approved by God And that gives me joy and peace and happiness in my life. Because I'm blessed by God. That means that he has put his stamp of approval on what I have done. And so this blessed word here, it carries a lot of weight. It's a very heavy word. And it means that you are doing in this aspect of your life, whatever he's teaching us in the Beatitude, this this occasion being meek in spirit, meek in your life. If you are doing that, God is going to say, hey, I am approving of your meekness, that's exactly what I want you to do. And so this word blessed is a very all-encompassing word. It's a very powerful word. He says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, we need to understand what Jesus means by meekness. Because the world today would tell you, and and even in your mind right now, baby, there are some, some images conjuring up and conjuring themselves up into your mind, where you think about meekness, and I always think about some shriveling coward over in the corner going, oh, don't hurt me. That is not what Jesus is talking about when he talks about meekness. As a matter of fact, meekness, somebody said, is not weakness. It is strength under God's control. Let me say that again. Meekness is not weakness. It is strength under God's control. In order to kind of take away that that idea that we have that meekness is weakness, because we just feel that way. The world would tell you that, church. The world tells you that all the time. What am I supposed to do when somebody wrongs me? I get revenge. Revenge. What do I do when people infringe on my rights? I defend and stand up for my rights. That's not meekness. But that's what the prevailing idea is in the world. And so meekness goes completely, biblical meekness goes completely against your flesh and your spirit, your carnal spirit, that unsaved, unregenerated uh, unregenerated spirit inside of you. Meekness, true biblical meekness, goes completely against that. Our first reaction is always to defend ourselves. Isn't it? If I come over and talk to Brother Jeff, and I criticize and get all up in his face and start saying terrible things about him, his first reaction is going to be defend himself. But we see that Jesus' brand of meekness is the exact opposite. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You know how we can see what real meekness is? Meekness is not weakness because the Lord claimed to be meek. Now think about that. 
sovereign creator of the universe, God Almighty in human flesh, said, I am meek. Matthew chapter 11, just flip over a couple chapters from where we're at right now. Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says, Take my yoke upon you, Jesus speaking, and learn of me, Jesus says, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know what Jesus just said? He said, I am meek. Now, any of you going to stand up to Jesus and say, boy, I think you're a weakly coward? I'm not going to. Anybody that steps off into nothing and says, I think I need to be having some light here and light appears, I'm not messing with them. Jesus said he was meek. David A. Bedman said this, he said, meekness is strong, not weak. It's active, not passive. It's courageous, not timid. It's restrained, not excessive. It's modest, not self-aggrandizing, and it's gracious and not brash. Let me tell you, we have such a bad and a poor idea of what meekness is. Meekness is not weakness at all. And let me tell you, I I wrote down and read this uh, three or four times, and I just can't say it any better. I love the first opening statements of the commentator uh, in what he says about Jesus and meekness. He says, What did Christ mean when he used the saying which has been translated, blessed are the meek? We can always understand what our Lord meant by what he was and is. For he never preached anything that he did not practice. So let us see in what sense he could truly say, I am meek and lowly at heart. You see, Jesus never preached something that he wasn't practicing. And if you want to see what meekness is, you look at Jesus. You want to see what faith is, you look at Jesus. You want to see what uh, righteousness is, you want to see what perfection is, and on down, love, all the different characteristics and categories. If you want to know what it truly means, look at Jesus' life. He's the perfect example. So the commentator goes on to say, the easiest way for us to think is to think of the things that make us feel unmeek. Or in other words, where we react and we want to defend ourselves. Those things are discourtesy. Ever been standing in line for about an hour and a half waiting to get in somewhere or to buy something? And then somebody cut in line right at the end? You ever been in traffic on a one-way exit? And you sit back there, 5,000 cars back, and watch all these, let's call them knuckleheads? That run up there all the way past, and then they force their way in right in the front three cars, and they get off on that exit, and you're just like, "Uh, God bless you. I don't know what you say, (laughs) right? I don't want to know what you guys say when you're in the car and that happens. But this courtesy will eventually, if you don't uh, control it and you don't allow the Holy Spirit to control you, it will lead you to being, let's just say, unmeek. Injustice. Boy, you don't ever get anybody riled up anymore than if something happens that's unjust. If something happens to one person that don't happen to the next person, people get really unmeek in those moments of their life. Insincerity. The commentator says, now parents, I didn't say this, commentator said it. Stupidity. Treachery and violence, those are the things that bring out uh, the difference, the exact opposite of a meek spirit in us. Now think about this. We're going to go back to thinking and looking at Jesus' life and how he displayed meekness. In the face of such things, what was the meekness of Christ? Our Lord was mocked and derided and literally spat upon. And he answered nothing. He was unjustly accused, dishonestly condemned, when he was accused and answered nothing. Pontius Pilate said in his astonishment, don't you hear what they're saying about you? What do you answer? 
And again, our Lord answered him not a word, the scripture says. Is there in all the history of the human race a scene of more deathless majesty than that silence in the face of insult and injustice? When Christ's friends betrayed him, when they all forsook him and fled, he uttered no reproach. When Peter denied him, he turned and looked at Peter with that look which redeemed him, a look of confidence and trust, and Peter was able to pull himself together and to become one of the greatest of all the apostles. When Judas Iscariot came and kissed him in the garden of Gethsemane, he said, friend, wherefore art thou come? Friend, is that not almost incredible from one who was never guilty of the slightest insincerity? He uttered no reproach, and he met with violence and death on the cross. He uttered no reproach. All he said was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That, my friends, is meekness. Now, did Jesus get angry? Absolutely he did. You see, we equate meekness with never getting upset, never getting angry. No, no, Jesus got very angry, righteously so, When he entered into the temple and he saw what everybody was doing with God's house. He got very angry at the injustice of other people towards other people. When they were not, when he was being criticized for healing on the Sabbath day. He got very upset at the Pharisees and those that were trying to keep people from being healed. But when he got angry in a righteous and perfect way, it was always about other people never about himself. You see, that is biblical meekness. You can get upset about injustices in the world. You can get upset about people being criticized and slandered. You can get upset about insincerity and all these other things when it has to do with other people in God. But when it's pointed towards you, a meek spirit allows God to handle all those things. And just allows God to use them and to be a blessing to those people, even that curse you, Jesus said. Meekness is yielding our rights to God so he can demonstrate his peace and power through us. But meekness, if you read Galatians is a fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. You cannot react in a meek way in your flesh. Don't even attempt it. It won't happen. If you're not walking and living in the Spirit, when those people cut you off on the highway, the Holy Spirit and a meek attitude will not come out. And so Jesus is teaching us here in the Sermon on the Mount that all these things about kingdom life, all these things about the law, and all these things that Jesus wants us to do so that we can be blessed or approved by God, you can't do it on your own. Absolutely have to be yielded and obedient and full of the Holy Spirit of God in order to live a meek and lowly life. Now, I want to show you just a couple of practical things, Ephesians chapter 4, about meekness. We're going to look at a couple sections of Scripture, and I just want to, I want to put this down into everyday life so that we can take it home with us. One of the things about worshiping God is the Bible says in James 1, 21, that you need to receive the engrafted Word of God with meekness. And so you need to receive not only the message today, but you need to go and apply it to your life on Monday. And so we're going to try to help you to do that today. Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 1, Paul says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering." Forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, here's a real practical thing that you need to understand about meekness. 
Paul tells us that we need to be worthy of the vocation wherewith we're called. He also tells us that we need to live the Christian life in lowliness and meekness, forbearing one another. You know what that word forbearing in the original means, if you put it in good Texan? It means putting up with other people. You say, well, preacher, I don't like what somebody said at church to me. Well, put up with it. Well, preacher, I don't like the way they looked at me. Put up with it. You see, a meek and lowly spirit is such that it doesn't matter what people do to me. I'm allowing God my rights, and if he wants to defend me, he will. If he doesn't want to defend me, oh, well. When people in the church say bad things about you or assume that you're doing something that you're not doing or they lie about you or they criticize you, you say, what? Oh, yeah, it happens. (laughs) You see what's interesting about a church is it's made up of people. And you know what people are? Do we got to go back to last Sunday and show you what people are? People are sinners. Pastors are sinners. And so people, hang on for it, sin. And when they do that, they usually offend other people. And so if we're going to live a life of meekness, God is calling us only by the power of the Holy Spirit to put up with everything that happens for the glory of God, and to love other people. To show God's love through us, we have to put up with a lot of stuff. Hey, let me tell you, those of you, and you know who you are, that are out there and you park all the way over on the line, and you get out and dink somebody's car door every Sunday, God's called us to put up with you. Is there anybody in here? Don't raise your hand. Please, please. Anybody in here that hasn't ever been bothered about something that somebody's done at Grace and Bible Baptist Church? If, you, if this is not your first Sunday, that might be the only way. And maybe so, even if you're the first Sunday here, you might have already been offended by something that's happened. No, all of us, all of us have been offended by things that have happened. All of us have been offended by a look that we got or something that was said or something we heard was said or something that we thought was done, something that the preacher did, didn't do, uh, the staff did or didn't do. All those things have offended us. But Jesus' call is for us to be meek and to let it roll off of our back and to forbear or put up with God's people. Mm, That's hard to do. Boy, it's hard to do. And let me tell you, when you feel all of that um, Christian rage coming out, it would be a good time to just stop and pray and say, Lord, would you help me to have a meek and a lowly and a quiet spirit? Look at Colossians chapter 3 for the next one. And don't think it's going to get better because it don't. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12 Colossians 3.12 says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Now, that whole verse right there really would give you a, a huge, awesome definition of what meekness really is. All of those words and all those phrases there are syn- synonyms uh, of meekness. Then he repeats what he said in the book of Ephesians forbearing one another, oh, and now he's going to add to it, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So not only do we have to put up with everybody, but when they offend us, we got to forgive them. 
Well, I tell you what, in every church, this is true, and I'm sure that it's true in our church. There have been people that have been offended by other people. And it could have been 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 75 years ago. And they have not forgave that person. Do you know what the word blessed means? I, I went over that, didn't I? The word blessed means approved by God. Your actions that we're talking about are approved by God. You know what is not blessed by God? Not having a forgiving spirit. You say, well, preacher, I, I tried and I tried to forgive them, but they just don't deserve my forgiveness. Did you? When God forgave you of all your sins, past, present, and future, did you deserve forgiveness? I know I didn't. I think the, the Holy Spirit can just take that little bit and probably do whatever he needs to with it. But the second practical application of having a meek spirit is forgiving other people. The last thing I want you to see is Titus chapter 3. 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, in the middle of your New, New Testament. Titus chapter 3. And I want to begin in verse 1 so we can get the context. It says, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. You ought to underline that verse in your Bible. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should may be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The third practical application for meekness in our life so that we can be blessed or approved by God is that you cannot, do not forget who you were. Don't forget what you used to be like. Don't forget in what kind of condition Jesus found you in. See, it's, it's awful easy to be critical and judgmental and not be meek and not have a meek spirit when you think that you have arrived. Well, you just don't understand how spiritual I am, preacher. Let me tell you, pride is the spiritual cancer to your spiritual life. Pride in your spiritual life will eat you alive. And if you think that you've arrived or that you've grown so much and all these things, let me tell you, the first step to actual biblical meekness in your life is to go back to where you started. Go back to where God brought you from and remember what kind of person you were. Now, we're not going to do it, and I wouldn't do it if I could. But how many of you would love for us to put up on the screen what you used to sound like and look like and talk like and act like before you got saved? Yeah, no, I don't think so. You talk about a way to clear a room. <laughs> that, would, that would empty out the auditorium right there. No, none of us want to go back and remember that. But, you know, a good step at meekness and having it practically play out in your life not only besides asking the Holy Spirit to help you, but just remember. Remember how and who and what you were. Look at what he says. To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish. I would have to say most of the time. 
disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Well, if you can just see that other person, if you've got to forbear or put up with them a little bit, if you can just look at yourself and remember how you were before the Lord got a hold of you, I think it'll go a long way to helping you have a meek spirit toward that person. And let me tell you, Christian, this is one of our biggest downfalls. When you look outside these walls at the people that do not know Christ as their personal Savior, the reason we come across so critical and judgmental is because we don't remember where God brought us from. You look at that worldly person and that worldly lifestyle that's disobedient to God, and he's on his way to a devil's hell. Let me tell you, that's where you were before God saved you. But after the kindness and love of God our Savior towards man appeared, we call it the gospel. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. There's certainly nothing we could do. But according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. We have been just by grace we have had our sins forgiven we've been given eternal life a relationship with God the Father co-heirs with Jesus Christ made a child of the family of God and let me tell you it does us good every once in a while to go back and remember the dirty awful pit that God reached down into to get us and to save us from it'll help you have a meek spirit now, let me tell you, church, I think that this is probably something that all people, every church, every church person, every Christian around the world struggles with this. But the Bible said, Jesus tells us that blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Not only will you inherit things that you would not have inherited on, in this life. Jesus told the disciples when they asked him about what they were going to get for leaving everything and all following Jesus. He said, look, in this life you're going to get houses and lands and families and prosperity. If you follow the Lord and leave everything and follow him. But so much more in the life that comes. So the meek in spirit will not only inherit and, and gain a lot of things in this earth. But there's a special place for the meek in God's kingdom. When he comes and establishes his kingdom in Jerusalem for the millennial reign, there's a special place for those that lived a meek and lowly life. I don't know about you, but I want to please my Lord in every way that I can, and I want to live a meek and a lowly life. Let everybody else criticize or say whatever they want to say about Roy Webster. I'm just going to let the Lord defend me. And I'm going to go on trying to forbear and forgive and never forget where I came from. Would you stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed? Heavenly Father, would you help us today? God, we understand that only by the Holy Spirit and by his power can we live a meek life. Lord, our natural tendency is to defend ourselves, to stand up for our rights, and then it's propagated and promoted so much in the world and this worldly philosophy just tells us over and over again that we need to defend ourselves. But Lord, we see by your great example what true meekness is. It's certainly not weakness, but it's power under God's control. Would you help us to live that kind of life? And Lord, if there's one here that's never had their sins forgiven, never asked you to come into their heart and save you, save them, and they have not repented of their sins and been saved, would you help them to do that today? Lord, the Bible in Titus was very clear. It's not by something that we can do. It's not by something that we can work. Not by some good works that we can do, but only by your grace that we can be saved. Would you help someone to make that decision today? Heavenly Father, just help us today. We are so needy. We're so weak. We're so frail. We're so sinful. We just need your help. Would you help us today? Speak to our hearts and then help us to put it into action. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.